great Jordan Peterson has arrived in New Zealand to promote his new book, 12 Rules for Life. The polarizing clinical psychologist seemed to have offended members of pretty much every minority community under the sun. Feminists, the rainbow community, and more recently, the alt-right. And yet people still can't get enough of him. His book has sold millions of copies. He has nearly two million subscribers on YouTube, and his talks sell out in a matter of minutes. So what is all the fuss about? He joins us now. We're going to find out. Good morning. Morning. So do you think that you are often misunderstood? I'm misunderstood by some people and not by others. Um, I don't think I'm particularly misunderstood in some ways by members of the radical left because I'm not a friend of collectivists and I'm not a friend of the radical left. So I think their concern that I might be an impediment to their wishes is justified. I think the tactics that are used to describe what I'm doing are generally reprehensible, but that's not surprising. It's part and parcel of the way political discourse is conducted today. A lot of epithets and name calling, oh, none of which is justified in my estimation. And a lot of pendulum swinging. You, you're not a friend of the radical left, and so people may assume that you are a friend of the radical right, but that's not true, is it? No, the radical right isn't very fond of me. There was a book written recently by a man named Vox Day called Jordanetics, which is a criticism of what I'm doing from the radical right perspective. And it's a particularly low blow book, I would say, uh, written by someone who's uh, dreadfully in love with his own intelligence. Um, but it, it's fine. For, as far as I'm concerned, it was a good thing because I'm not a fan of collectivists on the right wing either because I, I think it's a mistake to, to make your primary identity your group. It doesn't matter whether it's from a nationalist perspective or an ethnic or a racial perspective or a sexual perspective. It's a fundamental error and it's an extraordinarily dangerous one. Who it's, are you friends with? I'm friends with virtually everyone. That, um, you know, I'm often described as polarizing, but I've met thousands of people on the street um, and it, all of the interactions with the exception of two so far out of all those thousands have been unbelievably positive and um, the YouTube comments on my videos are 95 percent positive which is an unbelievably high rate on YouTube and um, even among journalists in Canada let's say the vast majority of the newspapers support what I'm doing and so the people who are objecting to what I'm doing, first of all, are objecting to what they think I'm doing, and they're a very small minority, and all they seem to do is read each other's press releases, because they virtually never talk about anything that I'm talking about. You know, they, and they tend to be very pejorative about my audience, which I think is quite appalling. So I, um, most of the people who see my live shows, and I probably, watch the videos are young men from say 25 to 35 not that young and they're an audience that isn't generally reached by this sort of thing and they're not there for political reasons or radical reasons they're there to get their lives together and many of them get their lives together they drop their addictions they drop their alcoholism they um, increase their ambitions with regards to their jobs. They take on more responsibility. They marry their girlfriends. They have a be they fix their families. They're in much, much better shape. And many of them are no longer suicidal and desperate. And there's absolutely nothing about that that isn't good. Why do you think so many young men then are suicidal and desperate, as you say? Is this uh, a fault of uh, post-religious society lacking meaning? Well, I think it's an assault on, on it's, 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 it's a consequence of the active discouragement of young men. And you see that manifesting itself through society from all the way from elementary school up through university. I mean, boys are underperforming girls at every academic level. They drop out far more frequently out of school. They do, and out of university, they're bailing out of the humanities like, and have been for 20 years. There won't be a man left in the, well, it's very unfriendly to be a man in the humanities at universities. I don't know why in the world you would be. 
um, the, the constant discourse is that Western civilization, although primarily a product of men apparently, which isn't something I particularly agree with, is fundamentally oppressive and patriarchal and destructive, and that any sign of ambition on your part as a male is nothing but indication that you're participating in the same oppressive structure. And so anything that's ambitious or noble or forward-looking or, or characterized by fortitude is actively discouraged and punished and it's very very disheartening do you think that a man's uh search for ambition or or uh to act nobly is is different is there a function different than than what a woman's should be do you think i don't know if it's a function of what a woman should be necessarily um i think that women's ambitions are um supported very firmly now in our culture from a very young age. I, I still think women have very difficult decisions to make because in their 30s they have a lot of things to sort out that have to be sorted out quickly, like the balance between career and family. And so each sex has its own particular cross to bear, let's say. But um, I think that there's active uh, in active attempt to to criticize what would you say active masculinity from a very early age and it's unbelievably damaging and it will of course spread over into women too because insofar as women take on masculine roles and masculinity itself is criticized then that will backfire and that'll happen soon enough we so. have we have a prime minister who is in her late 30s she's yeah. just had her first baby yeah. and she's running the country in her first term do you think that she comes up against um, different pressures of as course you say? It's, it's very difficult for 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 women who have young children to balance career with with a young family because they're basically guilty no matter what they do. If they're guilty when they're working because they're not with their children and they're guilty when they're win with their children when they're not working. And so that's a very complicated thing to arrange. And it's not surprising because of course one of the most complicated things that people have to do is to have children because they're, they're, they take a lot of time and a lot of energy and um, a lot of commitment. and and they particularly need a tremendous amount of attention in the first three or four years. And so getting that balance right is hard. And women are also often shocked, especially the ones that are more professionally oriented, with just exactly how much they end up liking their children, loving <laughs> their children, you know, because most young women are taught badly that the most important thing that they'll do in their life is their career and that's simply not true it's not true for most people and certainly not true for most women i certainly wasn't taught that myself i, I feel like i'm doing quite well in my career but yeah. i still have pressures uh people who are saying you know when are you actually going to see, su succeed properly by having a baby yeah i kind of find yeah. that slightly offensive i'm 38. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I've got through my early 30s uh, without that, without almost luckily, oh. when I look at what my friends have to deal with, with their children, oh. I almost feel a little bit blessed. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that it starts to get pretty lonesome in life after 45 if you don't have a family. You know, and so it's it's easy to consider the utility of an intense career, and, and like you have a very high quality career too. You know, it's that that's something that marks you out from maybe from, let's say, more typical people, and maybe perhaps that's worth more of a sacrifice. But you know, you're going to be you're going to live till you're 90 in all likelihood, and it's not easy to consider the, your life across its entire span. And there's something to be said for developing a very close-knit, intimate community around you if you can manage it. You have children and then you have grandchildren and that, to me, my, what I've experienced in my life, although I've had a very uh, productive career and a very interesting career, um, it's definitely been the case for me that my family has been more and more important to me as I've got older and I don't think that that's a, a un common experience so I'd probably have to clean my room first before I had a child because uh, it's slightly messy what does your room look like because you do suggest that that is the first place people should start 
oh well at the moment it's somewhat of a disaster and it has <laughs> been for about two years because for for a variety of reasons our house has been in a state of constant renovation over the last two years and I've been traveling and everything that isn't in order in the house happens to be in my room and it is a sign that my life in some sense has got beyond my ability to stay on top of and so uh, there's a fair bit of of ordering and 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 uh and strategizing and organizing that needs to be done but the rest of the house is in good order and so is the family so you do what you can do you adhere to most of your rules strictly oh, yes well strictly you know i mean it, everybody lacks discipline in certain ways but i adhere to them i would say strictly enough so that if you compared me to other people you would consider it strict Where do you I'm very think? careful with what i say for example and that's a rule be precise in your speech i'm very careful with what i say so if there was one thing that you wanted new zealanders to take away from your book or your talks what would that be well i think probably the most important thing, the, the thing that audiences everywhere have responded to most particularly is the idea that there's a integral relationship between responsibility and meaning. I mean, our society uh, being rather impulsive, probably because it's consumeristic and materialist, um, is predicated on the idea that happiness is paramount and it's likely to be found in various forms of impulsive gratification and that's just not sufficiently profound to sustain people generally through difficult times and the truth of the matter is that most of the meaning in your life that you'll find will sustain you is to be found in the adoption of responsibility and like the conservative types tend to talk about responsibility as a duty a social duty let's say but I've been discussing it much more as a psychological necessity and so it's 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 good to take on a uh, uh, to what would you say aim high and take on a, l a large burden of responsibility it matures you and it improves the meaning of your life it deepens the quality of the meaning of your life but it also improves things around you because it turns out that if you take responsibility and you aim to improve your own life and the life of others and you work diligently at that that not only does that improve your life in in terms of positive emotion and control of anxiety and direction and all of those things that are absolutely vital but that you actually do make things better around you and so that's a justification for your existence and you need that when th when times are hard and you're doubtful about the utility of your own existence and the so people understand that and it's it's an old idea and it's a very true idea there's a lot to an individual person and you can do a tremendous amount of good or a tremendous amount of harm if you live either properly or improperly. There's definitely a lot of people I think could grow up. So thank you for that. That's JB Peterson, clinical psychologist. Thank you very much. You bet. Very nice talking with Excellent. you. Excellent. Stay with us, mate.